Welcome into Sports Moments Betting Podcast, NFL Every Game on the Board, segment number one with Mid-Major Matt. Mid-Major Matt, welcome to the pod. How are you? Doing well, Drew. First time, uh, long time on the uh, NFL part of the uh, Every Game on the Board podcast. Are, are we popping your NFL Every Game on the Board cherry? We are, yes. I, I feel like I should need to be like the sports radio caller. Long time follower, first time participant in the uh, podcast. <laughs> wait, wait. Long time listener, first time caller, right? Yes, exactly. I love those guys. We got Baltimore at Buffalo. Top of the card here, Matt. Minus six looks to be the prevailing number. That's the Ravens, arguably the best team in the NFL on the road in Buffalo. 44 being the total, Matt. So first off, before we get into this, as as uh, it is Friday when we do this, this is when you start to lock in your card because this is when the injury reports are out. This is when you start getting a better handle on the weather and things like that. I know if you like a game on Monday or Tuesday, you're going to lock it in before the movement goes. But then, you know, it's Friday now. We have as much information as we could possibly have. You may get in before a lot of the sharps do. So this is a good time to do it. So this Baltimore-Buffalo game, you're looking at a couple of things. First off, Buffalo, uh, Baltimore is just a steamroller right now. They are just playing so well. The offense, you know, they had a rare blip on the radar last week against uh, San Francisco, but... They are just putting up points after points after points, scoring 45 on the Rams, 41 on the Texans, 49 on Cincinnati. They put up 37 on New England. So this offense is rolling. Lamar Jackson's clearly your MVP right now. The defense, look, they played pretty well last week, but they did give up over 170 yards rushing to San Francisco. We'll see if that carries over into this Bills game. I'm not a huge fan of the Bills offense. I've made some money taking the under with them this year because they've had some higher totals than I've. I've uh, been interested in, you know, you look, Josh Allen is growing up before our eyes, but he doesn't have a ton of weapons. He doesn't have a, a great running game. And the defense is really good. I had the under last week in the in the Thanksgiving game and it hit. I, I think I'm going to potentially look at the under here, but I don't know if I want to get in front of the steamroller that is Baltimore. Remember, the Ravens have a Thursday night game at home. Now, they would probably only take guys out if they're blowing somebody out in the fourth quarter, which I don't see that happening here. But something to consider is that Baltimore plays on Thursday night against the Jets coming up. Absolutely, Matt. That's a great point. Uh, the look ahead spot. Uh, and you're right. I mean, as far as playing the game there in the fourth quarter, they probably would have to be up a lot. But uh, it is something that's on their mind. Good point there. Mid-major, Matt, we got Washington at Green Bay up next. Packers minus 13 in Lambeau, 42 being the total, Matt. The crazy part here is, and it's a very, very, very long shot. I think I heard the the Redskins are 350 to one to win the division. They technically can win the NFC East. I mean, they would need a lot of help. They need to win out, have the Cowboys lose out, and then have the Eagles lose out. I think, but whatever. We're not going to worry about that. The Redskins have won two straight, though. They granted it was Detroit and it was um, uh, David Blah or David Blau, whatever it is, and then it was Kyle Allen and Carolina, and then Carolina fired their head coach. Now they go into Green Bay. How do you beat the Packers? You run on them. And that's what the Redskins do nowadays. I saw a stat that since Bill Callahan has taken over, they've had like three or four less than three-hour games because all they want to do is run it. You know, Dwayne Haskins has two victories to his name, but he's really done very little to actually get those victories. It's been all Darius Geis. It's been all Adrian Peterson. Also, them playing Josh Norman very little on defense has been a big help. Fabian Rowe has moved to the outside, has four interceptions the last two games. All this is basically saying it's not nuts to consider the Redskins here because if they could shrink the game a little bit, you know, two possessions here with the 13, 13 and a half points, it's not the craziest thing in the world. I'm not recommending it. If you look at the Green Bay Packers, they just finished a stretch of four of five on the road. So you know that they're going to be really excited to be home. They do have a home game against the Bears next week. Now, the Bears played well on Thursday night in terms of the division. You know, the Packers are well ahead of the Bears, but it's a big rivalry game. I don't think they're going to be looking ahead to that one, but it's something to consider. Uh, I read a story that basically said the Redskins are hoping to take away the run game and have Aaron Rodgers try and beat them. I hope that's not the case. I almost would dare the Packers to run on me more than try and and throw on me because, you know, you don't want to have Aaron Rodgers beat you. You'd rather have Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams beat you. I would say there's a there's a consideration here for the Redskins plus the points. But then again, I could also see them after these two wins getting absolutely steamrolled in Lambeau and the Packers just keep rolling. And Matt, you're there in Richmond, Virginia. You work for uh, ESPN Radio there. And I, I believe going back to the summer, you spent some time at the Redskins training camp, right? Yeah, Redskins had training camp in Richmond for about two weeks here. I was out there every day at practice. And look, I was calling for Dwayne Haskins to start from week one. I thought that, look, any mistake he makes, any misreads he makes, it's better to do it on the field than off the field. You look at Daniel Jones. 
He had that game against, uh, I think Tampa Bay was his first start. He won the game, but he's made a ton of mistakes since then. He's learning on the job, and I think that's what they should have done with Dwayne Haskins all along. He's come in. He's been a solid game manager. He makes one or two decent plays a game. He misses one or two reads, but like he's at least learning on the job, and I think that's going to be beneficial to him in his future. And what about like their depth? You know, you saw it firsthand. Is Washington a team, you know, that's down and and, and maybe, you know, buy low here at the end? We see it almost every year in terms of teams being money makers, the back half of the season kind of under the radar in the betting markets. Do you think Washington can kind of qualify as one of these teams down the stretch? I don't, you know, you're right. There's always one losing team that does a lot down this stretch. I mean, Washington's defense, I thought, was supposed to be really good this year. You look at the front seven with Jonathan Allen and Dur- Duran Payne, Ryan Kerrigan, who ironically didn't even play last week. You know, you look at some of these other guys, Ryan Anderson, that they're, they're actually building a solid defense. The secondary has landing columns. Fabian Moreau has some confidence. Now, they've gotten rid of Josh Norman, who doesn't play as much and was kind of a, a problem on that defensive side of the ball. I could see it. The question is, can you trust a bad team to go into Lambeau and cover the 13? You know, the, the Packers are just two and two their last four games against the spread. We know how good they can be, but we also know Devontae Adams could disappear. There's no, no true number two. They've gotten away from the running game other times. The Packers are so inconsistent. They're one of the most inconsistent teams for a team that's got, what, nine wins? So, like, it, it's really about do you trust a Washington team with momentum or do you trust the mystique of Lambeau Field and everything surrounding it and Washington reverting to the bad team they were for most of the season? And wh- which side of the fence do you fall? Right now, I think I would lean to the Redskins. But then again, when we, if I ever do this again or if we're on Twitter and people are like, are you nuts? Like, I could see myself regretting backing the Redskins when they're down, like, you know, 17-0 at halftime. But for now, I think if they run it and drain the clock and make this a shorter game and actually stop Aaron Rodgers a couple times, I could see them keeping it close in this one. I mean, yeah, you're getting doubles here in the NFL. I mean, a team that hasn't quit on the season. It's one of those, I feel like, hold your nose specials with the Redskins plus the 13, Matt. You just can't get angry afterwards. If you take the Redskins and they don't cover, you can't get angry because you're basically telling a really bad team to cover when they are a really bad team. True. Yeah. Can't get too mad at that one. So we got Denver at Houston up next. Talking rotation number one, three, five, one, three, six here. We got 42 and a half being the total here, Matt, eight and a half or nine. That's what the Texans are laying at home. A lot of things to consider here. First off, first true road game for Drew Locke. I mean, last week he was all right. He had a decent half. And then the second half, he didn't really do as much. And they played the Chargers. Who knows what you're going to get from the Chargers? This is the third road game over their last four. If you go back even further, it's their fourth road game over their last six. So, you know, this is an offense that scored 23, 3, 23, 24, 13. Now, granted, there were all these different quarterbacks that were under center. But the one thing that's been constant is their defense. It's very hard to throw in the guys. Chris Harris, uh, you, you look at some of the other guys in that secondary. You look at this team as a whole on defense. You know, even without Von Miller, who is questionable, I think, or at least he was, you know, he's not definite to play in this game. Their defense is still really good. The question is about Houston here. So they're completing a three game homestand. Last week, they beat up on New England. Highly publicized game. Sunday night game. Everybody's watching. The week before that, they beat up on or they win against uh, Indianapolis 20 to 17, a divisional game. Okay, so this is the final game of this three game stretch. Next week, they play at Tennessee, a monster game for them. So. I could see taking Denver. If it wasn't Drew Locke's first true road game, I'd be all over Denver right away. The thing I think I would like to play here potentially is the under. Once again, we're getting a pretty good price on a Denver offense that's not very good, even with Drew Locke. I expect him to make some mistakes, hopefully not giving Houston short fields. But I think Denver's defense shows up. I think Houston's defense shows up. I think there's a little bit of a letdown maybe on the offensive side of the ball. You let Chris Harris go with DeAndre Hopkins. And you make Will Fuller beat you. You make um, Kenny Stills beat you. So I could see a decent price here on the under for this game. Matt, next game up, we got San Francisco at New Orleans. 44 and a half being the total. Looks like the Saints laying two, two and a half in the Big Easy. Is it wrong that I still don't necessarily believe in the 49ers? Like, I understand. Like, you can't keep saying that. And they keep doing everything really well. I mean, their only losses are the Seattle game and then the Baltimore game. And then in both of those, they only lost by a field goal. But for me, when I watch San Francisco, I know how good their defense is. I know that uh, they are very hard to throw on. If you look at a lot of their performances, the secondary is very good. Um, 
And if you look, their rush defense is not the greatest. They've been you could beat them on the ground, which New Orleans would have to commit to Alva Kamara and Latavius Murray if they hope to win this game. But if I look on offense, they've got a solid group of running backs. They've got a good offensive line that's now healthy. They've got the tight end, one of the best tight ends in football in Kittle, but I don't trust their wide receivers. And I don't trust Garoppolo. If you tell Garoppolo he's got to throw it 25, 30 times a game, we've seen that at times he's struggled doing that. He feels like more of a game manager, a matriculate down the field type guy who's going to go and complete a lot of eight to 10 yard passes on the New Orleans side. I mean, look, we've already seen New Orleans lose at home to Atlanta. The game in Atlanta, they nearly lost. Now, granted, they needed to have, what, three straight onside kicks go against them to even make this thing close. The Carolina game, they arguably could have lost if Joey Sly makes that chip shot field goal. I know everybody's going to fall in love with the Saints because they're home and everything. And I, and I partially like the Saints because they are at home. But can they commit to the run game? Can they run enough with Kamara and Murray? Because I'm looking here, 18 carries, 18 carries, 28 carries, 11 carries. So, like, if you could tell me and you could guarantee me that Sean Payton's going to commit to the run and not have that much on Drew Brees' play, because, look, here's the key. If you can go and you can play, play, use play action – then I think Michael Thomas gets open. I think you could see uh, Jared Cook get open. Now, hopefully he doesn't drop it. But, I mean, you could see these guys get open. New Orleans is going to have to set up the pass by running the ball enough. And I don't know if Sean Payton's going to do it. This feels like one of those games where he's going to go and bring out his little freak, uh, Taysom Hill, and he's going to line him up all over the place and be like, hey, look at me. I'm an offensive genius. Look at what I'm doing to Taysom Hill. So uh, this is going to be a fascinating game that I'm going to use for future handicaps also because it could be the NFC Championship game. Uh, and, and the tight sp- spread reflects that. Matt, next game up, we got Cincinnati at Cleveland. Looks like the Browns minus seven at home. Forty one and a half the total here, Matt. Cleveland's such a hard team to trust right now. I hit the under on their win total for the season. I, I was not a believer before the year. I thought that all this hype was coming in with a rookie head coach, with Baker Mayfield in the second year, with a, a combustible set of egos potentially in Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham and everything. And I, I, it's kind of played out the way I thought it has. Um, you wonder what this team's mindset is after the loss last week. They had all this swagger, which I didn't understand. You had a coach wearing Pittsburgh started it shirts like you're supposed to be the adult in the room, and here you are showing up at a game with a Pittsburgh started shirt. And then <laughs> after the game, you're like, wait, I didn't think anybody would see that because I put a jacket on top. Like, we're not stupid, Freddie Kitchens. And I see that the market is reflecting that. Everybody's putting their money on Cincinnati. This is much like the Redskins. Like, are we all of a sudden going to buy Cincinnati because they played a highly motivated game at home against the Jets? You know, I, I just – Andy Dalton's good. He's not that good. And this is going to be a road game in Cleveland. And look, this team lost 17-10 to Oakland on the road, 24-10 in St. in L.A., excuse me, 23-17 in Baltimore. So they've put up some good performances, but I don't trust their defense. The question is, can you trust Cleveland in a potential spot where you're asking them to, to win by a touchdown? Can they do so? They have the talent to do so. The defense could certainly do so. Last year, they won 26-18 at home. They beat them 35-20 in Cincinnati. Once again, this is one of those things. It's a personal preference. You could go with the market and you could say it's Cincinnati's going to keep playing better against a Cleveland team that we don't know where their head's at. Or you could take the better team in this one. Hope Cleveland's focused. Hope Cleveland put all that crap behind them against Pittsburgh and just comes out focused and ready to kick some butt and, and, and win this game rather easily because I could see either one of those happening. He's mid-major, Matt. We got two games left on this segment. Then we're going to bring in Minty Betts and uh, finish off the back half of the NFL Every Game on the Board podcast. Mid-Major Matt is hot in the NFL. That's why he's on 70% since the start of November here, since actually October 27th, 71% in the NFL. So uh, really seeing it well in the NFL. And you can get his next three days, all-access service. That's uh, every sport he releases, college football, college basketball, NFL. You get them all, every play. For under thirty dollars, three day all access, less than ten bucks a day, using the coupon code MMM two nine at checkout. Twenty nine bucks, three day all access. MMM two nine for Matt Josephs. That's mid major Matt's three day all access pass at sportsmemo.com. Next game up, rotation number one four one one four two. Carolina at Atlanta. We got the Falcons laying three in the hook in Mercedes-Benz Stadium the day after the SEC championship game. Not sure if that matters at all, Matt. Um, not sure if you have a comment on that. But Carolina at Atlanta, 47 and a half the total. Falcons, three and a half at home. 
Well, here's what I'd like to inv- involve you, True, because once the big story with this game is Ron Rivera gets fired, and right. so they have the new voice in the locker room. I don't know necessarily how this team's going to react to that. You know, I think the bigger problem for Carolina right now is that Kyle Allen's getting exposed to being Kyle Allen. Like, we made him out to be this really good guy, and he won a bunch of games. But, like, how much did he do? To be honest, Christian McCaffrey did a lot of that work. Allen kind of was the game manager. But now we're starting to see the mistakes. The play he made on fourth down against the Redskins, running back 20 yards, like, that's a that's a rookie move right there. I know you have to throw the ball, but, like, throw the ball. You can't just – this isn't Tecmo Super Bowl – you can't run back to your own end zone and then somehow eventually get a touchdown out of it. So the new voice in the room, how is that going to you know, go over in the locker room? The defense has allowed 29, 34, and 29 the last couple games. Give me up 29 points to the Redskins. I know we talked about them earlier, but like that's a lot of points for a team that all they want to do is really run the ball. So the question is, and I don't know if you used this in your previous handicaps, is how do you handle a new voice in the room? And is it a black cloud that left or is it a team that's like, where the hell and why did you do this? I think it's, it's it's the situation based. I mean, sometimes it's it's the first thing you said. Sometimes it's the latter. It depends on this exact situation. From the press clippings I've read, it, it wasn't like the players hated him. So I, I don't know if it's going to be that big of a of a boon here for the Panthers. Um, I, I don't really have much on it. I, I guess I, I, I wouldn't necessarily look at it as a great thing, though, Matt. Yeah, it, it seemed like there were a lot of players who liked the guy. I remember yeah. Craig Olson said it was a dark day that he got fired and that, you know, Perry Fuel's the guy who's going to take over. And Perry Fuel said he's not going to tell anybody who the defensive coordinator is. On the Atlanta side, you've got a Falcons team that lost four in a row at home. And that rarely happens, at least four in a row. Going back to October 20th, they lost to the Rams. They lost to the Seahawks. They lost to the Bucks, and they lost to the Saints. Now, they have had extra time, but does it really matter? The offense doesn't run the ball enough. They don't run it well enough. Julio Jones wasn't 100%. And you've got Matt Ryan, who's playing like an older quarterback. And so I could see the value with Carolina. I could see it there. But the problem is, if they're all very sad and downtrodden over the fact that this is a, a, you know, a firing that shouldn't have happened, then you can't back that team either. But you can't back Atlanta because they're not winning at home. Like it's it's two teams that we don't know where they're going. And once again, I know we talk about it on the college football podcast and the advantage is that there's so many games that you don't have to bet every game. This is probably one you're going to leave off your card unless you truly think that either Carolina is really, you know, angry about the Ron Rivera thing and they're going to be distracted and they're going to play poor and Atlanta's going to win this game. Or you think Atlanta is going to be the team that's lost two straight at home the last two games and lost four straight overall. And, and actually, it goes back even further because they lost the Tennessee game on September 29th at home. It's a lot of question marks for this game. The best thing to do when there's a lot of question marks is just move on to something else. And we got one game left. We will move on to, guys, remember the coupon code MMM29 at checkout for mid-major mats. Three-day all access pass for just 29 bucks, less than 10 bucks a day. Coupon code MMM29 at checkout. We got 143, 144. Last game on this segment. Then we'll bring Minty Betts in for the the last, what, six or seven games here on the NFL card. No more bye weeks, guys. So it's a full NFL card the rest of the way throughout the season. We got Detroit at Minnesota. Vikings minus 12 and a half at home. 43 and a half the total, Matt. Lions have lost five straight. Uh, it does not look like Matt Stafford's coming back. I, I, you know, I have not heard anything different to the fact that Matt Stafford would, I mean, I, it, there's no reason for Matt Stafford to even play uh, the rest of the season. This is a very tough game for Detroit. This is a Minnesota team that's got to be feeling some things after the way last game ended. You know, you lose Dalvin Cook. Uh, and then I read afterwards that Dalvin Cook could have come back, but they held him out and everything. And I, I don't love to hear that sort of thing. Uh, this feels like one of these cannon fodder types games. You know, they come home, they exercise some futility, uh, some some demons. I don't like this offense though without Adam Thielen. You know, the the Vikings don't have enough weapons without Adam Thielen. Stefan Diggs, in theory, if you put Darius Slay on him, then that's you know Slay didn't play great against the Redskins because Terry McLaurin was open a lot. It's just uh, Dwayne Haskins didn't hit him. But I like Slay on Stefan uh, Stefan Diggs. And then the big question is, you know, they said Dalvin Cook's 100. percent But if they get a lead, even a small lead, do you save Dalvin Cook and you play Alexander Madison? I like Alexander Madison. Everybody said he's the type of guy in fantasy football, if you pick him up and he gets a start, he could win you your league. 
So this feels like an under here. Minnesota's defense is not what it used to be. They have to be smarting after the Monday night game. Xavier Rhodes looks washed up. Let's be honest here. He's no longer the number one corner he used to be. But can the do Lions quarterbacks get the ball to Kenny Galladay? Can they get it to Marvin Jones? I think this Minnesota team's going to be very frustrated, very angry with what happened last week, last Monday night. Granted, there's one less day of preparation because they played last Monday night. But I'd look potentially at the under here because I don't know how much Detroit's going to score. Their run game's not very good. They're not going to be able to keep Minnesota very honest. And maybe some of those pass rushers can get in the backfield. Uh, I, I think this is an under type game here. You know, 43 and a half is, is, is a little lower when it comes to the NFL, but it actually, it's, it seems like the normal number nowadays between like 42 and 44. So I lean to the under in this one, because I think that Detroit may struggle to score and the Vikings offense just isn't the same without uh, Stefan Diggs. They're not going to get any of those wide open touchdowns like Diggs had on Monday night against the Seahawks. Good point, Matt. And uh, yeah, that does it for segment one. Coupon code MMM29 at checkout for his three-day all-access at sportsmemo.com. Mid-Major Matt, you want to throw out anything before we shut this down? No, I, if I keep in the old sports radio caller tradition, I guess I'm going to have to say now, I'll hang up and listen to uh, what you have to say to that one. <laughs> I'll hang up and listen, absolutely. You got to turn down the radio when you call in, uh, all of that kind of stuff. Do you, do you take calls on your show there in Richmond? We do occasionally. We do occasionally. We're not Philadelphia or New York, so we can't do like a caller-based show, but we get people call up frustrated with the Redskins. They want to talk VCU basketball, Richmond basketball, UVA football, of course, the ACC championship game this weekend. So we get calls on that, but we'll never get a segment or two where it's all calls. We'll get like one or two a show maybe. Uh, I, I miss that, man. AM radio, just uh, people calling in and, and just talking nonsense. <laughs> it's fun sometimes. Yeah, if you can handle it, yeah. You, you take the drunks and you, you kick them off the air, but you handle the other people with, with delicate gloves. You don't want them to get mad at you. Uh, Mid-Major Matt, man, uh, I know you're a big college football guy. Projecting out, uh, heck, most people will probably listen to this Friday night, Saturday, uh, and some on Sunday morning. What What's your projected for for the playoff? Well, my hopeful projected for is LSU 1, Ohio State 2, Clemson 3, Utah 4. That's my hopeful one. Uh, what I think is going to actually happen, I bet somehow Utah is going to get left out for the Big 12 champion. Since I think Oklahoma is going to win, I bet Oklahoma is going to be the 4. I'll be very disappointed. And when you and I do this podcast next week, I'll take 30 seconds to rant as to why Utah should be in over Oklahoma. Of course, if they lose to Oregon, then I look like an idiot. But I'm putting Utah 4. Oklahoma probably will end up for, and then we'll just have this giant argument over it. Wow. I, I, I there's going to be fireworks if, if they jump Oklahoma over Utah, Matt, I, I don't think that's going to go over well with a lot of college football fans. Well, here's the thing. I don't think it, I don't think it won't. The problem is because I think that enough people haven't watched Utah and seen how good they are to say like, oh, it's disappointing. They all watch Oklahoma, the flash, the substance, Lincoln Riley, you know, Jalen Hurts. Oh, it's great for college football to have them in. But like their defense is so bad that LSU may put up 60 in the first half on them. So we'll, we'll see. Um, I hope that somebody, whoever makes the four, makes it a good game. But I have a feeling whoever is that four is probably going to lose to LSU by a lot. Yeah, and actually, we're recording this late on Friday. The Pac-12 championship game's about to actually kick off right now. What um, if Oklahoma and Utah played on a neutral site? What would you set the line at? A neutral site, I would probably set it like uh, Oklahoma minus one and a half, only because I know everybody would bet that, and then I'd want all the money because I think Utah would win. So, like, if I'm going to be a true odds maker, because I want the money, uh, and I, th- it's, you know, I set it as a short line. Let everybody bet Oklahoma, bet it up, and then boom, we get uh, – and Utah wins. Because I think Utah's the better team. I just think Utah has the defense. They have the offense. They have the speed. And, and there's three good units in that game. And the Oklahoma defense is the one that I'm leaving out. So that's what I would set the line for in that game. All right, man. Good stuff. As always, mid-major match. Check out his packages at sportsmemo.com. Three-day all-access. Huge discount here, guys, using the coupon code MMM. Two nine at checkout. That does it for uh, because we did the section one and section two here opposite. So uh, this is actually the last one we're going to be recording. So best of luck if you're listening to this now, guys. Um, have a great, fun, safe weekend. Enjoy championship Saturday. All the games on Sunday. We'll be back on Monday with Teddy Covers in the opening line report. But uh, next podcast on the list is Minty Betts and finishing off the NFL. Every Game on the Board podcast. Best of luck with your bets.